today, as we turn from the rush of daily life, may we find spiritual rest and renewal. You alone, God, can give us strength for our journey. Amen. Let us quiet ourselves in preparation for worship. Thank you, Carol. What a fitting, fitting song for this All Saints Sunday. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship on All Saints Sunday. When we celebrate the communion of saints, all faithful Christians, those already in heaven, and those living for God on earth are counted among this communion. Good morning. Good morning. We have several announcements. I'll just put them over here. Uh, Tuesday at 4 o'clock is the Bible study on the uh, pr film of The Chosen. Uh, Wednesday at 11, the mission committee meets. And at 4 o'clock this Wednesday, session meets. There's a, a sign-up sheet for fellowship coffee at the white, um, I think that's at the whiteboard now. Um, 
Lay leaders and greeters are always needed. We, um, I want to remind you that next Sunday, the second Sunday, we will have a potluck after church. So come and en enjoy fellowship with, with all of us after the service. The, I want to an, um, mention for us to keep the family of Pat Beavers. She died Friday. Services will be later this month, I think around uh, the 15th. So keep those in your people in your prayers. Um, we have a note of thanks from uh, the school nurse, Millie, and friends of the church. Thank you so much for the very generous clothes donations for the students of the Shenandoah School. You have such a big heart. I've appreciated your always thinking of our students here at Shenandoah Community Schools. That's from Christy. Also, uh, we have a word from Tim Owen. So today in Sunday school, we were talking about the Westminster Confessions and how our uh, Presbyterian Church we were just starting to talk about is a very political, or at least has a very political uh, history. I'm not going to ask you to vote or tell you how to vote, So, but it is a political organization. It's one of those organizations um, we have things that the church does that you have to be a member to vote as a, to be a member on. There are annual meetings, let's approve the budget and, and the meeting minutes, and those things aren't really important. But we do have things coming up that are important and, if, and you have to be a member of. If you're not a member, I'd like to personally invite you to uh, chat with me about it. I can tell you over the past 18 months, and well, we'll say 24 months since before I, when I started coming back to church, uh, when I moved back to uh, Page County, 90% of my conversations with Rick were about joining the church and why it was important to me to join the church and that uh, the Presbyterian Church and specifically this church because we were going to be nominating a pastor. And to be a part of the nominating process and not the nominating committee, you have to be a member of the church. And that was very important to me because I wanted to make sure that I had a voice in that. Not only just that I had a voice in it. Everybody knows I voice my opinion uh, in meetings all the time. I've joined a bunch of the committees and and lots of times I'll sit there quietly, but when I'm ready to talk, I make sure that I've said something. Lots of times I'll repeat it three times. I got used to doing that with my kids. But you have to be a member to, to be a part of the nominating committee. And we're all here. We're all a part of the life of this church. And this is the nominating committee is going to help define the life of the church moving forward. So as part of this political organization that does have an organizational structure. I'd like to invite those of you who are not yet members of the church to uh, become members and join me uh, in our effort to try to define the future of our church and our community and our place in Shenandoah. Uh, it's important to me and I would like as many of you to be a part of that process as possible. Having said that, um, we also, it's getting close to the end of the year, we are looking for uh, deacons and session members, and lo and behold, you have to be a member to do that too. <laughs> so um, thank you for uh, 
for listening to me and my pitch, but um, if you have any questions about the hows and wheres and whats and whys uh, that I have um, gone through in my deliberations and joining the church, uh, feel free to come after church today or in the future and chat with me, and I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. You were greeted this morning by Brianna Berkeley and Leslie Brooks, and we thank them for doing that and also providing the coffee and refreshments this morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Lift up your heads, O gates. The King of glory has come. Mourning and death shall be no more. Feast on rich food and fine wine. Come, let us worship the God of our salvation. Please stand for our hymn of praise, which is number 35, Praise Ye the Lord, the Almighty. confess our sins to God, from whom our help comes. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. You know our grief, wellspring of tears, and our longing to see your face. We long for you to come down and save us. In our sorrow and pain, we yearn to be touched by your healing love. As Lazarus before us, we need your hand to lift us from tombs. Open our mouths to exclaim with delight, Here is our God, for whom we have waited. Amen. Please join me in the responsive assurance of God's grace. The vision of a new heaven and a new earth is sure. The one who prepares a banquet before us, a feast of rich food and fine wine, will wipe away our tears. Rejoice and be glad. The King of glory is the author of our salvation. Amen. We are very blessed again today to have Reverend Dina Candler with us this morning to share the gospel and the Sacrament of Communion. Welcome, Dina. Well, good morning, Shenandoah. It's great to be here again with all of you. 
this morning, uh, we're going to be reading from the book of Philippians. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you would open these words now in your word, your sacred word, that they might be illuminated, that we might see you more clearly. It is in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. When we're reading, especially from the epistles, there is a sense in which we're reading someone else's mail. This was a letter that was written to a specific group of people, people who were Christians in the early church in Philippi by Paul. And so when we're reading something like that, it's important for us to know something of what's going on with them. But it's also important to know that it's not just their mail, it's our mail as well. Because this is God's word, and he has something to say to you and to me today. And so our scripture lesson today is from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Let's listen to the word of God. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear omen to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict which you saw and now hear to be mine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, when I was in high school, I was a foreign exchange student. I lived in Greece with a Greek family. And the organization that I went with does a wonderful job of helping students before we go to understand something of the language and the culture of the country to which we are going. And it was a great experience. And I loved the culture and the people. I had a wonderful family that I lived with. But in spite of the fact that I really tried to, to acclimate myself and be one of the Greeks among the Greeks, there's a part of me that stood out as different. And it was probably more noticeable to the Greeks than it was to me. It wasn't anything wrong. It, was, it wasn't anything wrong with their culture. It's just that growing up here and being enculturated with so many things American, I just stood out. Maybe you've experienced that yourself sometime. You've maybe traveled to another place. Maybe you've lived in another country and you've experienced that. And if you have, I think it helps us to understand something of what Paul is trying to describe in his letter to the Philippians today. He, he does something here that's very interesting. Paul loves in his letters, in his epistles, to talk to those early believers about how it is they are to live their lives. Very common for him. But he does something very different here that we can't pick up very readily in the English translations. Because one of the things that he generally does when he's talking about that, it literally says that you should walk like this, and then he goes on to enumerate it. I, I love that verb, that original verb, because it talks about how Christianity is not just about what we believe, but also about how we act. But here he does something a little bit different. And so what we read in the English in verse 27 is this. He says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And other translations say, live your life. But in fact, it's a different word than he usually uses. And it's a word that occurs only three times in the New Testament in Greek, the original language. It occurs one time in the book of Acts. It occurs here. And it occurs in Philippians 3.20. 
Now, the word polituste sounds like politics, right? And that's where we get the word. It refers to citizenship. It does get picked up better when it's used in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, where it's translated as, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying is something different here from what he said in those other places where he's used a different word. Because he's reminding the Philippians and us that we have a different citizenship. Oh yes, they are citizens of Rome, and oh yes, we are, at least most of us, citizens of the United States. But we also have another citizenship a higher citizenship that comes under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so Paul wants to talk here about how we're to live our lives as citizens of that place. And so this is how Paul describes what it means in verse 27 to live as citizens of Christ's gospel. He says first that citizens under the lordship of Jesus Christ are to stand firm means we're to be unwavering in our devotion to him. Secondly, he says our standing firm is to be in one spirit. And like the Philippians, we live in a culture in which it's not always easy to stand firm in our faith. But Paul exhorts them to do this by being in one spirit. Now, there are different words for spirit in the Greek. And I find it interesting that here the word that is used is suke, which often is translated as soul. And I love to think of it that way, that we are to be of one soul in our citizenship, and so then we can stand firm. It's a lot harder to stand firm when you're, when you're idle, when you're a, a solo. And it's much easier when we're united, because then we can deal with a lot. And finally, this in verse 27. He says that they, we, are to be striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. It's a very interesting compound word there that contains the word with, that more literally is tran can be translated as striving side by side. I like that. Now, all three of these points in verse 27 that he makes are speaking to two issues. And the first is that we're called to community as Christians. And as individualistic as this culture is, and as much as we sometimes hear or may even say that we can be Christians without others, it's not true. And it's not biblical. Part of that's the issue we just heard about even earlier about becoming a member of a church. It's joining together in community in an active way. It's a crucial issue, that unity that comes with it, because that's the second thing. He speaks about the unity of that community. We live in a time of great division everywhere, between countries, in politics in this country, and in the church at times. And the call to unity for us as citizens of Christ's kingdom is crucial. And that kind of unity doesn't have to do with us agreeing about everything. That's, we make a mistake when we think that. It has to do with being united for the gospel of Jesus Christ, despite whatever our differences may be. That he is the one we unify around. And that unity is crucial for two reasons. First, it gives us strength to withstand whatever challenges may come our way. And secondly, it's a witness to the world around us where unity on anything seems to be so absent these days. So if we're to live then as citizens of Christ's kingdom, what does it mean for us? Well, it means our first allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Paul wants the Philippians to know of their loyalties not only to Rome because they were citizens of Rome as people living in Philippi, but even more importantly, to the Lord. It's Christ and not Caesar 
to whom they owe their primary obligation. And it's the same for us. I am grateful for the privilege of being a citizen of this country. And I carry the responsibilities that go with that. But my first allegiance is to Jesus Christ. I once served a church where there was someone who was unhappy about a policy that the session had put together regarding worship. And he wrote a letter to the session saying that we are first uh, Americans and we are secondly Christians or Hindus or Jews or Muslims or whatever. And the session very seriously considered what it was this gentleman had written to them. And then they gracefully and graciously responded to him that no, we are first Christians and secondarily Americans or Hondurans or Germans or whatever. That we are people who have our first allegiance to Jesus as our Lord because it means he is our sovereign. Now there's a good news piece to that. Because come Tuesday, do you, do you know about Tuesday? Okay, I want to make sure you knew about Tuesday. There are going to be people who are unhappy. I don't know which people. I don't know why. But there are people who are going to be unhappy. This morning on my on my way here, I, I stopped by the uh, drugstore where I always stop on Sunday mornings to buy the newspaper. And the young lady who always waits on me was talking about the upcoming election. And she said she was feeling worried about it, about the outcome. I have no idea who it is that she's, she's voting for or what it is she thinks about it. But she feels some trepidation. And maybe you do too. Well, here's the good news. It's not that Tuesday doesn't matter. What's more important is that you and I belong to a kingdom that is stronger and kinder, a covenant kingdom that is going to outlast anything that comes in this country, in any other country in the world, from now until eternity. And because of that, Regardless of what happens on Tuesday, we are people who do not have to live with anxiety. Thanks be to God. However, there's always a however, isn't there? It also means we're called to put down roots where we live. There's a tension between being citizens of heaven while living in a different place. Because we're called neither to conform to the world or to withdraw from it. So how do we live distinctly, but not separately? And how do we not assimilate so much that we lose our identity? Because we're called to do both at the same time. People love to quote Jeremiah 29, 67.2% of all the magnets sold in Christian bookstores have that verse on it. No, oh, I made that up. That's not true. Don't fact check me on it. But it's a, it's a wonderful verse. I do have it on a magnet on my refrigerator. And perhaps you know it. This is what it says. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Oh, it's great news, isn't it? But what people too often fail to take into consideration is the context in which God spoke those words because he spoke them at one of the very worst times in the history of the nation of Israel. They had just been carted off because of their, their failure in their faith following. They'd been carted off to the Babylonians and spread throughout the Babylonian Empire. And God told them, just as he's speaking this verse, guess what? You're going to be here for 70 years. 70 years, that's a long time. I'm 70 years old, I know, it's a long time. And furthermore, he says this to them at the beginning of that chapter. 
He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have set you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. These ancient words written long before Paul ever wrote his letter to the Philippians are reminding God's people that despite their situation, despite where they are or how bad things are, the call is to put down roots where they are and seek the welfare of everyone around them. And it's very similar to what the call is that Paul is speaking about to the Philippians and the same call in our lives as well, no matter where it is that we live. Because we're not called to isolate from the culture in which we live, but rather to penetrate it. And God calls us to put down roots wherever we are, to live in the present and not just the hope of the future. But... It also means we will have opposition when we do that. Paul goes on in verse 28 to say this, that we are to do this without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. I don't care where you live. The world doesn't like all the things that we live by as citizens of Christ's kingdom. And it's not fun to have opposition. And some of us are people who like to avoid conflicts, so we'd rather just go along with everybody else or withdraw. But that's not our call. And again, we're called to stand firm, calmly, and not be surprised when something else happens. The word that for frightened here occurs only in this place in the New Testament. There are lots of other words for frightened. But this is a kind of a, a calmer word. It's not about terror. It's the same word for, used for uh, a horse when it shies. You know, if you sneak up on a horse and startle him, that might happen. So he's saying, stand firm enough that not even some little thing is going to throw you off when it happens. And when you do it, don't be obnoxious and show restraint in responding to others. If we're going to be citizens of his kingdom, we will experience struggles and suffering, Paul tells us in verses 29 and 30. As Paul writes this letter, he is actually in prison. He's in prison because of what he's been doing as a citizen of Christ's kingdom, for proclaiming the good news. And yet, of all of Paul's letters, this is the most joyful, Philippians. Paul is not surprised at what he is suffering, and he knows it is worth it. And he wants them, he wants us, to have our antenna up as well, to know that this is a part of a deal. One of the things I love about the Bible is its honesty. Sometimes it's its brutal honesty. It never tries to sell us something cheap. Follow Jesus Christ and your life will be wonderful. You'll make lots of money and everybody's going to love you and you are never going to have any problems again. That's Disney World. That's not the gospel. And Disney World is a wonderful place to visit, but it's fiction. And you and I belong as citizens to a different place. And with that comes some other things. As Christians who have set down roots in this country, our suffering has been small. But others suffer much. I was praying for many of them last night when I went to bed. And we should be aware that it is just a part of living in a place that is not our real home. And finally, when we truly live as citizens in Christ's kingdom, it's a witness to those where he has planted us. 
There's a way in which our differences are noticed, just as mine were in Greece and other places where I've traveled. Not because I've tried to stand out, but just simply by being who I am. And as Christians in this world, people may think we are odd. But the way we live can make a difference. There's an interesting observation about this that we have from history. There is a letter from the second century called the Epistle to Diognetus. We don't know who Diognetus was. We don't know who it was written to or anything about that person. But it is an amazing document to talk about his observations of Christ Christians he had witnessed somewhere in the Roman Empire. And as I read a portion of this letter, I want us to think about what it would be like if some alien from another planet who'd never heard about Jesus Christ, never been in a church, never knew anything about Christianity, came and observed us. And what kind of letter might they write back to their planet? Because that's a little bit what this letter is like. So, the manners of the Christians. For the Christians are distinguished from other men neither by country nor language, nor the customs which they observe. For they neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a peculiar form of speech, nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men. Nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrines. But, inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lots of each of them have determined, and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. And I need to pause here and explain this. There was a practice in the Roman Empire that when a baby was born who was undesired, perhaps because of some deformity or defect, there was a practice that was in place of turning the baby out, which meant to abandon it in a field or in a garbage dump as something of no value. It became the practice of the Christians to go and to gather up those infants and take them in and to raise them, to adopt them. It was one of the earliest places where we saw adoption by the Christians. And so it is marked out here as observing something very different. They have a common table but not a common bed. They are in the flesh but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things and yet abound in all. They are dishonored and in, yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are evil spoken of, and yet are justified. They are reviled and blessed. They are insulted and repay the insult with honor. They do good, and yet are punished as evildoers. And when punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. Friends, these words were written about brothers and sisters of ours who we have 
yet to meet. Brothers and sisters from so many centuries ago that reflect exactly what our lives today should be. Our true citizenship should be so apparent to those around us that they notice that in these days we have no anxiety. It should be so apparent that it causes them to wonder and even more to hunger for the blessed relationship that we have with Christ our King. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, let's join in our hymn of response, Seek Ye First. This is Christ's table. And so he invites everyone who is truly sorry for their sin and who longs to be alive in him to come and to celebrate this sacrament in his name. Would you please join me in our invitation to the table? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful that once again you have set the table for us. We come as people who are desperately in need of you, not because of our deserving, but out of our need and out of your graciousness to us. Our prayer, O oh God, is that you would take these very common elements and set them aside for your holy purposes that we might be nourished for the journey as citizens of your kingdom. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I invite the elders who are serving to come forward. Let's join together in prayer. Loving God, you have given us a share in the bread and the one cup and made us one with Christ. Help us to bring your salvation and joy to all the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us continue in prayer. Oh Lord, we know that we live in a world that is different than your design. 
We know that we live in a world that knows more of division than it does of unity. We pray for those places that are divided by war. Especially today, we pray for the Middle East and for Ukraine. We pray for peace to come to that place and for people to know the hope that only comes through you. We pray for divisions in this country, even as we are approaching an, an important day. And we pray for unity and for good leadership. And we pray for churches who sometimes are more divided than we should be. We confess, O oh God, that sometimes we miss what our real calling is. And yet here you come to us anyway. You love us. You long for us to be united. And our prayer, O oh God, is that you would help us as we unite around you, that we might be such a visible representation here of what it means to be a citizen of your kingdom that others would be, would be drawn to the light and hope that only comes from you. All of this we pray because of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is our privilege as citizens of God's kingdom to be invited to participate in his kingdom as we offer our gifts. And so let us now offer our tithes and our gifts to the Lord.
Friends, let's, Friends, let's join in our unison benediction. Go forth as God gives you strength, blameless and upright, persistent in integrity, trusting without wavering, and confident in God's love. Go in peace. Amen.